What's up friends, it's Endymion, and in my last two videos I've covered various aspects of what I call the post-woke era, which is where I confidently believe we as a society are moving towards in the future. So today I want to examine the downfall of Hollywood and why its conquest to make everything woke and full of identity politics will lead to an eventual cultural reset. It doesn't take a genius to see that Hollywood as a whole is in a bad position these days. Prior to the pandemic, the Hollywood machine was printing money at astounding rates, with 2019 having a record-breaking $42.5 billion box office gross, with movies like Avengers Endgame crushing the box office and delivering one of the best superhero movies of all time. Well, in my opinion, anyway. From 2008 to 2019, there have been signs of Hollywood becoming more identity politically driven, but for the most part, I would say Hollywood during this time, was still able to release many bangers that didn't enrage audiences. Movies like Christopher Nolan's Inception, or Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, and other films that told a great story first, like Sicario for example, which I loved. That dinner scene in the villa? Oh, good stuff. And even when movies during this time had less male presence in favor of strong female characters, it still felt earned with amazing movies like Mad Max Fury Road wowing everyone. Which, when you think about it, that movie, even with it having Mad Max in the title, he's not really the main character with Furiosa instead being the leading role. But that movie works because of its spectacle and balls-to-the-wall action. It didn't feel like it was talking down to audiences either. We even had crazy movies like The Wolf of Wall Street, which was about a womanizing businessman who scammed his clients out of millions. And even when Hollywood did make films about very politically driven topics like 12 Years a Slave, it did it by showcasing the horrors of its subject matter and it felt authentic. So like I said, from 2008 to 2019, Hollywood was booming like never before. The Marvel Cinematic Universe was birthed during this time and has now become the single most profitable franchise in Hollywood. But like the eras of history, time will inevitably lead to new beginnings. And with 2019's $42 billion box office, it's a far cry from our current times. 2020 understandably was a low point for Hollywood due to the pandemic, and 2021 lagged behind as well. 2022 would see the first slight increase with $26 billion, but it's still a ways off from the monstrous 2019 box office. While some would argue the death of Hollywood lately is because of the pandemic, I think it's a lot deeper than that. For the past few years, many of Hollywood's biggest franchises have all been infected with the brain rot that is identity politics. With a large bulk of what comes out these days mostly being remakes of beloved franchises, and then there's insane woke Hollywood releases like The Woman King. And I think out of any movie that has released recently, The Woman King might be the perfect example of why Hollywood is dying. The Woman King was made for 50 million and grossed roughly 98, with the film needing to break at least 100 in order to turn a profit, which it didn't. But money aside, I think a movie like The Woman King couldn't exist at any other time in history, and it's for all the wrong reasons. And I've been avoiding this film for months because of how politically charged it is until now. See, that film depicts the Agaje, an all-female army that serves the West African Kingdom of Dahomey. The film's plot depicts these warriors as heroes who fight for justice, when in reality the actual Kingdom of Dahomey was a brutal nation built upon the exports of slaves and human sacrifice. The film acknowledges these things somewhat, but chooses to still depict these characters as good. It's the epitome of woke Hollywood, where producers take a story that hits all the right political checkboxes, but rewrites its history in order to make the movie happen so messages can be pushed. The reality is that this film's actual historical roots are extremely problematic and do not paint African people in a good light. And I hate to say it, but making a heroic war film about the Dahomey Kingdom would be like German people making a heroic film about Hitler but rewriting him and his empire to be empathetic to push a political message. Because the more I read about the Dahomey Kingdom, the more insane this entire film's existence became for me. 
For example, King Gezo, who's played by John Boyega, was actually known as the Slave King, with one of the homies' biggest exports being African slaves to other nations for profit. And this slave trade didn't end until the Europeans, of all people, stepped in to stop it. The film also shows the Agaje female warriors as badass fighters who could take on anyone, but in reality, they were massacred by the French. During the First Franco-Dahomian War, hundreds of their warriors were gunned down by French soldiers, and during the Second War between the two nations, the French put an end to the Dahomey Kingdom and ended the slave empire forever. Apparently, during the Second War, at one of its key battles, almost the entirety of the Dahomey military was wiped out in a matter of hours by the French, with the Dahomey losing around 500 warriors during the battle and the French losing only 6 soldiers in the same fight. But the movie won't tell you this or mention it because the film was made by Hollywood to push a narrative. And this is one of the biggest problems with Hollywood these days, is that they would rather twist and rewrite history to make a film that pushes certain identity political checkboxes if it means their ESG score will rise and push the woke agenda. But they won't showcase nations like the Dahomey in a negative light because it is not politically correct, even though it would be right to do so considering its history. I also found it curious that the Woman King doesn't really shed light on the whole human sacrifice angle the Dahomey were known for. Men were allowed to have multiple wives of varying ages, and when a king or high-ranking male died, the grim reality is that the Dahomey would force the wives of these powerful men to drink poison in order to follow their husbands into the afterlife. And once I discovered this, it was even more perplexing as to why this pivotal societal role wasn't showcased in The Woman King, but the reason is is obvious. Because revealing that the nation behind a movie called The Woman King, which by the way the title makes no sense in the first place, would lose all credibility if audiences found out that the all-female warriors served a small fanatical group of powerful men and we can't have that in media these days. Viola Davis, who stars in The Woman King, had this to say as well. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing I'm gonna add to okay. that. Okay. It will just be a moment if people don't come see the movie. Okay. okay. That's right. Because you're sending a very clear message to a machine called Hollywood. Mm -hmm. A machine called Hollywood um, is interested in green. It just is. It, it, it is what I do. So if you don't come see it, then you're sending a message that black women cannot lead the box office globally. Hey. That you are supporting that narrative. And if you want to normalize it, come see it the same way you would you know, um, the same way you would Black Panther, Spider -Man. Iron Man, Spider-Man, yeah. mm -hmm. or any other movie that doesn't have any of us in it. Yeah. Or one or two of us in it. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What's also interesting is that Viola Davis's role was originally played by Lupita Nyong'o, but she left the project after learning the true history behind the Dahomey. And while I didn't think I'd spend this long talking about this one example in this video, I do think it's important to show how far Hollywood is willing to go in order to push narratives. And the unfortunate reality is that these identity political pushes are not going to end anytime soon. Remember Bloodshot, the movie with Vin Diesel? Well, that movie was meant to start up the VCU, or Valiant Cinematic Universe, which is the third biggest comic book publisher behind Marvel and DC. After Bloodshot underperformed due to the movie just not being good, but also being released right when the pandemic struck, Paramount still wants the VCU to exist, and they are apparently deciding to reboot their already failed universe with another questionable character in the form of Faith, or Zephyr if you want to use her superhero name. Faith is a feminist superhero who can fly and is called groundbreaking by her creators. She's also plus-sized and was even used to push Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2016, where Faith saves Hillary from a supervillain during one of her speeches. Faith was created in 1992, so she clearly existed well before woke politics in Hollywood, but she's your typical nerdy fangirl turned superhero character. And Marvel did that with Kamala Khan already, and that show failed to gain an audience. Even Comic Book Resources thinks Faith is a terrible idea for the VCU's beginning, with Exo Manowar being a much more interesting character to get their own movie before Faith does. But that's Hollywood these days. The obvious slam dunk ideas are almost always tossed aside in pursuit of woke identity politics. 
But what can we expect from an industry that tried to protect movies like Cuties, which reviewers almost universally loved? With critics like Bernadette Barden saying, we need more feminist stories like Cuties that illuminate the constraints girls and women face and help us chart a path to full gender equality. Or Jill Wilson who said, Cuties is a powerful statement about letting kids be kids. And while a movie about young girls dancing on stage and exposing themselves is somehow celebrated by the industry, on the flip side you have the woke mobs coming after classics like Tropic Thunder. With these mobs being outraged when they found out that Robert Downey Jr. donned blackface in the film to play Kurt Lazarus, which to this day, I consider to be one of the funniest roles in any movie ever made. I don't believe you people. Huh. What do you mean, you people? What do you mean, you people? Huh? Thankfully, its creator and star Ben Stiller refuses to bend the knee in which he said on Twitter, I make no apologies for Tropic Thunder. Don't know who told you that. It's always been a controversial movie since when we opened. Proud of it and the work everyone did on it. And he's right. Tropic Thunder was always meant to be controversial and politically incorrect. Because that's what makes it funny. No, look at his ass, man. You people. Look at that beating. And it clearly worked because the film grossed $195 million and was a box office success. And believe it or not, Robert Downey Jr. also got an Oscar nomination for his role as Lazarus. And what's even more impressive is that many audience goers didn't even realize that it was Downey Jr. in the first place. He was so good in the role that people literally thought he was a black actor. For 400 years, that word has kept us down. And even then, people are trying to cancel him for it, and I say screw that, because Tropic Thunder is amazing, and I even recently watched it again, and it still holds up. It pokes fun at everyone and delivers an absurd movie that stands the test of time. And that's why to this day, people still love and talk about it. Whereas in five years, no one will remember The Woman King or movies like Bros, which had one of the worst box office returns in years. The reality is that the movies that are bringing in the most money these days are the ones that go against the woke identity politics of Hollywood. Top Gun Maverick and Spider-Man No Way Home couldn't care less about pushing the newest political message. Instead, those movies just doubled down on nostalgia and gave the fans what they want, which was a movie that was fun to watch and something to get lost in. The biggest problem with woke Hollywood isn't just that these movies are forgettable, but that they're more concerned with pushing a message than entertaining the viewer. It's almost as if the entertainment of the audience is secondary to the identity politics or representation. If your movie was created just to push something, like Ghostbusters 2016, which thought having a full female cast meant it could somehow shield the movie from criticism because of it, well, it backfired, and everyone hated that movie. Of course, all films have a message to push, but before, it used to be something universal that enlightened people. For example, Batman Begins is about the crippling effects of fear and how overcoming your own mind can help you rise from your own despair. Jurassic Park is about the ethics of playing God and how nature cannot be contained no matter what mankind tries to do. And Encino Man is about wheezing the juice. Wheeze the juice. No, 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 wheezing the juice! Also completely random, but I love how in Encino Man, Brendan Fraser gets slushy juice all over his shirt, but in the next scene, his shirt has no slushy stains on it. It's completely random, I know, but God, I love Encino Man. Anyway. With a little juice. No, we think that you ooze. Too many movies today are not about neutral messages or lessons that people can learn from. The Woman King is basically saying women are good and white men are bad. Like, thanks, I can't imagine why your movie underperformed. Hollywood for the most part has lost the plot, and even its biggest franchises like the MCU are shadows of their former selves. Back in what I consider to be the MCU's golden era, you had movies like Iron Man, which was about the dilemma of what Tony Stark's legacy was going to be. Would it be his military weapons used on innocence, or could he become something more? It was also to an extent about toxic masculinity and Tony realizing that his actions were making the world worse and not better. And then you had masterpieces like Daredevil, which was full of nuance and layered characters. It was also created in 2015 and ended in 2018, when entertainment was just starting to become garbage. So Daredevil, 
feels like a relic with it being an actual competent show with real writers, actors, and great themes. There's a great short interview between Bill Maher and Quentin Tarantino where they discuss what Hollywood has become lately and I think showing some of that conversation would help your understanding of what's going on. So please watch. But th th there has become a thing that's gone on, it seems like in this, especially this last year, where, um, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking uh, 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 Ideology is more important than art. Way more, certainly to the awards. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, ideology right. trumps art. That, ideology right. trumps it's individual terrible. effort. Ideology trumps good. Ideology trumps yeah, entertaining. There's two kinds of movies, virtue signalers yeah, uh -huh. and superhero movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you're always, you know, lauding, our, we both know the 70s as kids. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So we, we, idolize, we, grew up in it, we yeah. idolize it, and you've done... We lived through the new Hollywood. Right. Like, oh, those but but that was a golden age. Yeah. Whenever you catch a 70s movie, you know, whether it's Three yeah. Days or The Condor, it's like, oh, yeah. my God, what a... You know, The Godfather. Mm -hmm. And are you bullish on the future movies? Because... Well, well, well look, you have to always look at... Are we going to get this, back this, to look, that place? Look, this happens... Seems, this, ha this comes in waves. This absolutely comes in waves, mm -hmm. all right? So it's like... Uh, uh, okay, just looking at the 40s, all right, that was during the wartime, but that's also the time that you had film noir, where you actually, even though with the Hays Code, you had these dark, dark stories that were being told. But then after the war was won, then you had the 50s, which was the first of the completely homogenized decades, where you couldn't say, sh you couldn't say shit if you had a mouthful, all right? And uh, every... <laughs> Every bestseller, every play that was turned into a movie, if there was anything uh, sexual about it or anything, okay, that's all going to be drained out of the movie. It's going to be weaned out of the movie. It's just really? the way it is. Mm. It's just the way it is. You just always knew that going in. And then the, uh, to me, it's one of the worst decades in Hollywood is the 50s. And then and the 60s, pretty much from like 1960 to 1966, was the 50s part two. Right. But then what we think of as the 60s Late. starts in about 67, and that's right. when New Hollywood Bonnie comes and out. Yeah. And that's a, an right. absolute positive response to the homogenized 50s. So it's right. going to come back again. Okay, and then we go, it goes into the okay. 70s, but then we go and went to the 80s. All right. And that's why you came up with Politically Incorrect, because that was the first, this is basically the 80s part two, what we're living through right now. Well, I'll just take one more go at it. There's going to be a new golden age. Please be there and part of it. <laughs> Tarantino is right in his assessment that we are currently in a stifled, homogenized era where ideology matters more than anything. But like I said before, and Tarantino echoes as well, that age is coming to an end. The next 10 to 20 years of cinema will likely start to become like the 80s in time. Where the bubble of superhero movies and political nonsense reaches such a fever point that Hollywood has no choice but to create good stories again in order to survive. Everything as of the current political climate we're in right now has to be designed so you can be fed a message while also being treated like an idiot. Because that's how these modern creators see us as ultimately. Every movie for the most part wants you to hate yourself and vilify everyone around you and believe that you're a victim because of things like your skin color or political views. Hollywood is dying because they are currently not interested in telling good stories but using their platforms for everything except actually entertaining you. It's why The Proud Family is now a baby's first activist show, and why the new Peter Pan movie is called Peter Pan and Wendy. Because it can't be called Peter Pan anymore because that's misogynistic, and the Lost Boys now have a bunch of girls in it because ESG reasons. And I'm not even mad that Peter Pan is an Indian boy, frankly I could care less, but my complaint is that Peter Pan's supposed to be devious looking. I mean, look at the original Disney cartoon version. Look at this guy and his devious eyebrows. This Peter Pan screams that he's a prankster. No hate for whoever this guy is, but he doesn't look devious at all. He just looks like a kid. Again, I don't care what color Peter Pan is, but for God's sake, make the kid look at least somewhat like a devilish prankster. Peter Pan should look and act like he's going to swap your grandpa's heart medicine for Viagra pills. He has this demeanor to him like he's the kind of guy who would date a woman and ask her to marry him and then at the altar in front of all her friends and family, he would say he just wants to be friends. Like he's supposed to be the ultimate troll when it comes to Disney's characters. His trolling of Captain Hook is what makes those movies fun and this kid 
just doesn't give me devious vibes. But of course, the one change they won't be doing is Captain Hook, who's still a straight white male because that's all white guys can play these days, apparently. If they're not the villains, then they're just the butts of jokes. Gotta love gender equality in Hollywood today, am I right? But all of Disney's live-action remakes look awful. To be honest, I haven't watched any of them myself because I don't want to ruin the nostalgia I had as a kid by seeing any of these abominations. Why would I want to ruin movies like Mulan by watching its remake which has changed Mulan into a superhuman warrior who needs no help? and it stars an actress who champions concentration camps in China. While I don't think we're out of the woods yet when it comes to wokeness and identity politics, it's very obvious that these messages in movies are failing far more than they're succeeding. And I truly do think it's only a matter of time before the executives and investors of these companies are fed up with losing millions and force companies to start making good movies again. Because when you have Transformers identifying as trans in your new movie, it's clear that these things are not being done for genuine reasons. Why would anyone care what gender or pronouns a freaking alien machine is? The only reason this change exists is simply to push an agenda. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they had a tie-in commercial where Optimus Prime publicly endorses Joe Biden. Because as absurd as it sounds, it would sadly sit into the insanity that is the current season of life we're all living in right now. And I know some people are expecting me to dunk on The Little Mermaid, but to be honest with you, I couldn't care less about that movie since I never even liked the original in the first place. Yeah, Ariel is black now, but in all honesty, I just don't care. She's a mermaid for God's sake, it doesn't matter. However, I am triggered by Flounder's look in the live-action remake. Because what in the fresh hell is this goblin-looking abomination? This is Flounder? Are you kidding me? Is this remake supposed to be a horror movie? Flounder looks like a serial killer. But in all honesty, I'll most likely avoid The Little Mermaid the same way I have every other Disney remake. Because clearly, even when Disney sticks to the aesthetics of the original like Pinocchio, they still end up making garbage. Looking at the amount of movies I've actually thoroughly enjoyed a great deal in the past three years or so, they can all likely be counted on one hand for me. Because as soon as I can feel the movie talking down to me or filling itself with nonsensical dialogue to artificially inflate the film's runtime, I just leave. I got better things to do than listen to Viola Davis tell me I'm a bad person because I don't want to watch her fantasy movie where she kills a bunch of dudes in a revisionist propaganda piece that conveniently rewrites any negativity that actually happened because it goes against the narrative. My dear friends, we are currently in a deluge of mid-entertainment offerings, but there are some bright spots out there like The Batman, which while having some problems, it's still a solid movie and thankfully it isn't a CG mess that's having a gangbang with my eye sockets. And also, I know this doesn't really have to do with woke politics and film, but can we normalize shorter movies again? I'm sick of needing to spend half my day watching these modern flicks. Why are most movies two hour plus nowadays? See, that's why I liked Venom Let There Be Carnage. I mean, don't get me wrong, that movie was pretty awful, but at least it was only an hour and a half. So while the story was nonsense and Carnage was woefully underutilized, I appreciated that the people behind it at least didn't waste three hours of my time like most movies these days. I'm looking at you, Avatar. Oh my god, that movie was, Jesus Christ, it was way too long. But it seems we're still in the infancy of woke propaganda and the slow death of Hollywood as a whole. Since the pandemic happened, Hollywood is projected to lose over $160 billion in growth, from 2020 to 2025 due to the whole virus shenanigans. So combine the slow but painful recovery of the worldwide box office with less movies performing well, and people largely not showing up to theaters as often is really worrying for Hollywood going forward. Not to mention that viewership for things like the Oscars or the Golden Globes keeps losing millions of viewers each year. Because nobody wants to listen to out-of-touch millionaires circle-jerking each other in an auditorium as they lecture those beneath them about things they have no clue about. Woke Hollywood is dying and ultimately it is not the fault of the consumer or even the pandemic. It is the collective tone-deaf approach of the executives, producers, and writers that have all largely forgotten what actually matters when it comes to making films. 
When your movie is designed to preach or lecture instead of entertain, you've already lost the plot. When you blame your audience for not watching a movie while also openly hating on the very people your livelihood depends on, you have no one to blame but yourself. In the end, the death of woke Hollywood is not coming because it's already here. And if these hacktivist types want to blame anyone for its downfall, they need to only look in the mirror to see who's really to blame. Because woke Hollywood is dying and it is absolutely their own fault. I'll be back. Your butt, sir!